Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to our Coffee and Conversation Hour uh, of the day. Today is Tuesday. And um, today we're going to be talking about, as you can read on the bottom of the screen, as you can see, it says developing coping skills for substance abuse recovery. And I wanted to talk about this because I think it's very important that people should utilize the coping skills that they have developed, uh, not only while they're in uh, some type of treatment, uh, residential treatment facility, whether uh, residential or uh, OP, outpatient, uh, it's very important. It's very, very, very important to utilize the coping skills that you have learned and developed to carry it over, uh, not only just utilize it for the moment or for the state, but make it part of one's lifestyle. And so uh, we bring you this, this article by OwlsNetRecovery.com. This article coming from Owls, that is O. WLS Owls net.com net recovery.com. And so uh, let's jump right into the article. No, no, no need to prolong the, uh, the group session. Once again, this is a hybrid session. Uh, you're more than welcome to come and be a part of what we're doing here at 72 North Pearl Street here in Bridgeton uh, at the Capital Recovery Center. My name is Craig. I am a recovery coach here. And so as you can see, I am solo uh, today. And so let's talk about what it means to uh, have developing coping skills for substance abuse recovery. The article states, completing drug addiction treatment does not always guarantee success. In fact, a large number of people who battle these problems suffer relapses. Indeed, this is a part of the cycle of addiction. Recovery is a lifelong process, and it's important to know the proper coping skills for substance abuse. To gain the most success, it is vital to learn how to identify triggers and how to develop positive coping skills for substance abuse that help to overcome temptations of drugs or alcohol as a means to fill better. And so the article says, uh, not only that we must identify the triggers, but we must uh, develop some positive coping skills to combat uh, the trigger triggers that gonna occur, will occur, and often does. And so we want to share this information to let you know, uh, give some general idea or refresher or reminder, or for those who first time learning about triggers, why it is so important for us who are in recovery to know uh, certain triggers and how to counter that with some positive reinforcement. And so the next thing we want to talk about, what are triggers? Notably, the article says, triggers bring emotional, social, or environmental reaction that reminds a person about his or her past substance misuse problems. Many times, a trigger deliver, delivers an urge that leads to relapse. A trigger can be external or internal. For example, the article says a trigger may be a person, place, or smell that reminds someone of past negative behavior. In the end, it may lead a person to cope in an unhealthy manner. And so uh, those are a reminder, or those are some of the things that one must look out for, be aware. Uh, it says person, place, or smell. And sometimes you may hear people say person, place, or thing. And so, and I, I, I quite often heard a person say, you know, I smelled a certain smell before and it, it made me uh, felt uh, nauseated or it may uh, remind me of when I was using and things of that nature. So 
Uh, we want to remove ourselves or be aware of persons, places, or smells. And so let's talk about where these uh, entities can occur. First of all, it says environmental triggers. All right? And so environmental triggers. There are one, two, three, four, five bullets that we're going to talk about. The first one is talk about spending time with a person who did drugs with an individual may cause triggers. For example, a drug dealer, friend, or coworker who has done drugs with a person may bring back negative feelings, all right? And so we must be aware of the environmental triggers that can occur uh, from uh, drug use or being around a person that we once used before, whether it be a co-worker, a friend, a drug dealer. And so we must uh, not only recognize that can be a trigger, but once we identify that as being a trigger, to remove ourselves immediately. And oftentimes, you, if you have watched this uh, coffee conversation or any of our uh, uh, virtual hybrid uh groups that we have already mentioned we always we talk about how you must tell on it you know tell on uh what making you feel uncomfortable what what is uh what are some of the triggers that uh making you think of past behaviors or past events that may uh cause you wanting to indulge in that behavior and so we say tell on it when we say tell on, we mean tell somebody who's going to give you some sound, adequate advice that's going to encourage you to uh, utilize some coping skills. All right. And so let's move on to the second bullet. It says a place where a person wants their drugs can lead to triggers. For example, I'll give you some examples. A bar, a bar, a club, restaurant, or friend's house may remind a person of old habits. And so now this this bullet talks about a person, a, a place where a person wants uh indulge or engage in uh addictive behaviors. Remove yourself away from that. Or if you know that there's going to be those type of activity being taking place, whether it be alcohol, whether it be drugs, if you know that's going to uh, be there and you are uncomfortable, especially for those who are in early stages of recovery. Uh, we always like to be mindful that we may not have uh, developed uh, strong coping skills if we fresh out of a residential treatment, or if we just begun the process of recovery. And so we would want to uh, test the waters. Uh, when I say test the waters, we want, want to uh, step inside that arena again, especially when we're going in uh, down the straight and narrow in a different path than where we used to, uh, where we once came from, all right? The third one is talk about attending an event where people are drinking or using drugs may trigger an individual. For example, a wedding or a concert where alcohol or drugs are present may cause a person to crave a substance. And so, you know, we may hear a song, uh, that puts us in that mood or remind us of the mood of activity that we uh, had a, what we thought was a uh, pleasurable time by indulging or using alcohol or drugs. And so if we know that weddings, parties, things of that nature where there are uh, people using alcohol or drugs, and we, especially as we are in uh, early stage of recovery, we will, we, we will not uh, advise anyone and we should uh, go the opposite direction. And it's okay to tell people if they invite you to those events and uh, you feel uncomfortable and you're not sure of yourself or how strong you are, it's okay to let them know. I say, listen, I would love to partake in the event uh, I understand that, you know, it's a ceremony, a blessed occasion, but right now, you know, break it down to me right now. I'm, 
I'm, you know, getting back into uh, my recovery. I am working on uh, build, building a healthier lifestyle. So uh, I'm gonna have to pass on this one because, you know, honestly, you know, I mean, you know, just to let them know, be truthful, say I don't trust myself at this time of uh, being around. And then, and that they are really your friend and they really are have genuine concern for your well-being, they will be uh, more than understanding and be more supportive with you uh, along your journey of recovery. All right. And so then the fourth bullet, bullet talks about hiding places where a person used use to place drugs or alcohol may lead to triggers. For example, going through a particular drawer or a closet may stir emotion related to past drug use. And the last bullet talks about objects may cause cravings. It says objects may cause cravings. For example, an empty pill bottle or drug paraphernalia may trigger negative behavior. And that's very interesting. And so we have read articles where uh, it tells uh, family members who uh, know that they have a loved one who uh, is in the early stage of recovery or those who may be struggling with some type of substance disorder to uh, either lock up the medicine cabinet or remove any uh, anything that uh, object that may trigger someone to relapse. All right. And so the next one we want to talk about emotional trigger. This is very important, especially as men. A lot of times we have uh, uh, emotions that we uh, don't express ourselves. We know women, they are very prone to express themselves or how they're feeling. But as men, you know, a lot of times we may uh, keep it in stock. So let's talk about, let's talk, let's read some of the emotional triggers. The one, number one, it says anxiety. Then there is fear, stress, depression, boredom. External triggers are extremely dangerous. They make a person develop a desire to use drugs subconsciously. On the other hand, internal triggers are even more challenging. They bring feelings associated with substance abuse and cause intensive cravings. Triggers are not always negative feelings or situations. For example, a person may get a promotion at work and reach for drugs or alcohol to celebrate. That's very, uh, very important. The article says triggers are not always negative, <coughs> excuse me, feelings or situations. That is so true. You know, uh, we may feel jubilated. We may feel happy that we just got a promotion, we got a praise. We might feel that. Uh, hey, let's celebrate, but it's all right to celebrate. Let's let's be clear, you know, just because you're in recovery, that don't mean that you can't have a good time. It's saying that it's all right to celebrate, but celebrate in a way that uh, is going to bring uh, joy, upliftment, and that is going to uh, bring more happiness into your life than sadness because there's consequences uh, for every action we take. And so if we take the right action, positive reaction, we're going to get positive results. Negative re reaction, we're going to get negative results and so, so on and so forth. It says, recognizing these triggers is one of the essential coping skills for substance use recovery. Let's talk about some of the unhealthy coping skills. Let's get into that. All right, let's talk about and identify what are some of the unhealthy coping skills. Specifically, the article says, coping skills are techniques used to deal with stress and difficult situations. Although they may not be long-term solutions, they help a person deal with painful experiences and things that may lead to negative behaviors. Unfortunately, many people develop unhealthy coping skills. Unhealthy coping skills for substance use can do more harm than good in the long run. And so, if you're if you're someone like myself, uh, I when I was in uh, active use, 
of substance use disorder. I used to mask um, my emotions, a lot of things, situation, pain, whatever may may happen, and I uh, didn't have, didn't utilize my healthy coping skills. I turned to unhealthy coping skills, and therefore uh, it led to me making a bad decision, wrong decision, and living a uh, unhealthy lifestyle. And so I had to learn that there are there is choices that we make in our life and that we can make uh, good choices or we can make bad choices. My advice to anyone that's watching this segment uh, to uh, focus more so on making good choices, uh, making good decisions, and that would lead to uh, the best results that one can have. And so you may hear people say, oh, if you don't follow the crowd doing uh, unhealthy or negative uh, decision, making unhealthy decision, they may call you a, a cornball. They may call you a, a poop part of the party. You know, all these uh, titles, we want to dispel those stereotypes because you don't have to be a cornball. You don't have to be considered uh, a poop part poop part of the party uh, just because you're not making bad, terrible decisions. You can still uh, have a good time by making good, positive decisions. All right, I just wanted to leave you with that one. And so we're going to move on a little further. We're not going to hop on the decision, but we do want to, to share that. Falling back with people who abuse drugs or alcohol. This is very important. During recovery, it is vital to stay away from old pals. Let me read that again. During recovery, it is vital to stay away from old pals. If you don't know what pals mean or what they insinuated, they're saying stay away from old acquaintances, old friends, all right, who have been involved with your previous using habits. It's better to reflect on the people who are willing to help you remain sober. In other words, a person must focus on the people who offer positive support. It is essential to set boundaries with old friends and former hangout locations. Therefore, if a certain bar remains a, reminds a person of old habits, it is wise to avoid that place. In the end, the smartest way to avoid triggering is to cut ties with individuals who use, who use means of temptation or encouragement to keep old habits alive. Remember, I just talked about, you know, people are going to always have these stereotypes. They may have a perception of you, and they may have all types of labels that would they that they will try to attach to you, but you have to be more smarter than that and dispel those myths or those labels that people placed on you and uh, move forward, all right? This is one of the many coping skills for substance abuse recovery. Let's talk about one that I think is very important for uh, most people, and it talks about bottling emotions, all right? Oftentimes, a person thinks that bottling emotion makes the feeling disappear. However, keeping things hidden leads to poor behaviors. Bottling emotion makes people withdraw and seek other soothing mechanisms like taking drugs or alcohol. Instead of creating stress and anxiety, it is essential to keep lines of communication open. Remember, it's always good to express of how you are feeling. Once you recognize that there is uh, some type of trigger or craving that, uh, that you may uh, encounter or feel, doing emotions or whether they're external or internal, please find someone that you can uh, talk to who you feel that who is relatable, that can understand uh, your your plight and what you and how you are doing your best to make a uh, better decision and making better choices in your lifestyle. All right. All right. So let's talk about we did we talked about the negative Let's talk about the importance of positive coping skills for substance abuse. Let's talk about some of, some of those things. 
after treatment for drug misuse, positive coping skills help a person remain on track so that relapse doesn't occur. After identifying triggers, there are ways to adapt and to deal with social situations without turning to drugs or alcohol. One of the reasons I thought this article was is so important is that oftentimes people come out of uh, whether it be detox or residential treatment or whether they're doing an IOP or uh, IOP is for uh, inpatient. I mean, oh Lord, IOP stands for people with outpatient uh, external uh, and also OP. OP is uh, outpatient, all right? And those who oftentimes who deal with uh, substance use disorder, once they come out of treatment, oftentimes they think that uh, they have it all together. And so I thought this article was very important to uh, expound on the importance of utilizing the coping skills, the tools that one has uh, learned while they are in some type of treatment and utilize those uh, coping skills they call it a toolbox. They say whatever coping skills or coping tools that you have learned or have engaged in while you was in treatment, go inside, revisit those toolbox, just like uh, any type of professional person who's building a house, a cop, a mechanic, oftentimes you have to go into a tool to fix things. And so um, that's why I thought this article is so important. The article continues, says, during addiction treatment, counseling helps a person pinpoint patterns that leads to problems. For relapse, it is important to recognize dangerous triggers. In fact, there are common triggers that affect many people in recovery, such as. Let's talk about them. Let's talk about them. All right? It says, one of them are poor self-care, isolation from friends or family, negative thoughts, stress, denial, falling back into old habits. All right? So you want to be aware of, of those things. Let's, now let's talk about nine healthy coping skills that help drug recovery. Nine help, healthy coping skills that help drug recovery. The article says, as previously, previously discussed, it's easy for individuals to turn to negative coping strategies while in recovery. However, to maintain sobriety and to enjoy a happier life and better well-being, there are a few healthier, healthier coping skills for substance abuse. And we're going to talk about each one of them real fast. And one of them is be honest. I want you to be honest about uh, your coping skills. Many people bottle emotions and hide the feeling of anxiety or stress. Instead, it is better to be honest when these types of feelings surface. When a person is open and accepted, accepting of these emotions, it is possible to stop, to take a breath, uh, to take a breath, a breath, to realize it is normal and to move on. And so be honest with yourself. You know, if you're feeling some type of way and you feel that some type of urge, uh, cravings or triggers, whatever it may be, is coming on, be honest with yourself. Let someone know. Uh, uh, express how you're feeling. Don't bother the emotions up. Uh, let it out so that you can uh, get some help. That's what the main thing about, it, you know. Someone don't know how you're feeling or what are you going through unless you reveal it to them? And so the next one, it talks about, uh, it says, meditate and be mindful, all right? Uh, many treatment facilities uh, teach patients how to meditate and focus on the moment. Deep breathing techniques and various meditation exercises clear a person's mind of distraction and allow them to observe internal experiences. Um, when I was in uh, most 
treatment facility, they, they have what they call behavioral modification, uh, exercises, technique, breathing technique that they use, utilize to help one to desensitize uh, how they're actually feeling. And when they say desensitize inflation, it means to remove yourself from a chaotic scene or a just confused or disturbed situation to a calm scene, a more relaxed environment. So that's why they use these techniques. And oftentimes you may feel that you, you, have, you don't have the time. You may be busy, you may be at work and a trigger or urge or craving may come on and you may not have time to do the actual exercise or go through the full technique, but you can just, um, if you find yourself stressed or some type of anxiety coming on, you can just uh, pause for a minute or go go somewhere, maybe just five minutes and breathe. You know, until you get back into uh, clear head or clear feelings where you, you're feeling calm, more relaxed, where you can go back to with your normal lifestyle uh, without feeling so much uh, tension, you know, for whatever given situation it may be. All right? And it says, when stress and anxiety are lowered, there is a low chance for relapse. Like I said, breathe, you know, you may not have the whole, you may not be able to go through, if anybody ever went through a behavior modification uh, course and they know what I'm talking about, you have to go through a breathing exercise. It's called uh, desensitization, whereas you will have to, uh, sometimes they use uh, music, soothing music, or they may dim the lights, or they may tell you relax your, your muscles. You may not have time for all that. You may be working, you might be uh, traveling, or whatever you may be at, whatever, you just, sometimes you just have to remove yourself, lower the anxiety, the article said. Mindfulness allows individuals to gain control as well. Mindfulness is one of the most effective coping skills for substance use, all right? That's number two. We went over number one and said, be honest. Number two, uh, it says meditate and be mindful. We're talking about nine healthy coping skills that help drug recovery. Number three talks about attend group therapy sessions. All right, that's very important. Being an active member in group therapy links a person with others who are suffering from the same cravings. All right, so you we're not an island on, uh, we're not an island on of our own. We are people who are often have, we are people who often communicate. Uh, we, we are sociable human beings. That's what I'm trying to say. We are sociable human beings. And so don't allow yourself to be isolated, uh, interact with people. Uh, it says go to a group setting or a group session. Right, and say attending meetings or other individual therapy session keeps a person on track and helps him or her deal with negative feelings. If a person struggles with another mental health disorder at the same time, it is essential to meet with a medical health professional as well. And so, not only the article talking about those who suffer or dealing with uh, substance use disorder, it's talking about those who have been diagnosed with some type of mental illness and so they, in, a, in the healthcare field they call it being diagnosed dual diagnosis uh, uh having a dual uh, issue whereas not only you have substance use issue you also may have a mental health uh issue and they advise that one must seek medical help uh, from a professional. I am a recovery coach. Uh, we here at Capital Recovery Center, we have recovery coaches here. We're not therapists, we're not uh, counselors. We don't do treatment here. Uh, we don't uh, sponsor people here. We are recovery coaches and we help you, uh, link you to the medical professional people that you will need to address uh, 
different issues. And so if you feel like you need to talk to someone as a recovery coach, please feel free to call the Capital Recovery Center, telephone number 856 391 Number four, it says organize a system of support. It says it is extremely important to have a system of support throughout recovery. The process never ends. Therefore, having a healthy relationship with people who understand the needs of a recovery and of a person in recovery can help maintain sobriety in the long term. Besides friends and family, a network includes other people who are trying to avoid drugs and alcohol. A system of trustworthy individuals comes in handy when temptation arises. All right? Organize a system of support. That's number four. Number five talks about Begin a journal. Journalism, journaling is an excellent way to open up without fear. Mm -hmm. Journaling is an excellent way to open up without fear of judgment or criticism. Putting words to paper allows a person to document, document emotions, fears, thoughts, and setbacks. In other words, a person can look back at good times and bad times so that he or she can move on from negative situations. Also, it is a good way to log how far a person has come on his or her journey to sobriety. That's number five, begin a journey. Number six, once again, we're talking about uh, nine healthy coping skills that help drug recovery, all right? And so number six talks about self-care. This is very important on a drug Misuse problem takes hold of a person. He or she may begin ignoring his or her health. In fact, this worsens the cycle of addiction. What an individual does not eat properly that will suffer from low levels of energy. What an individual does not eat properly, they will suffer from low levels of energy, which can lead to depression. Also, removing a regular exercise routine brings a person down. So it goes hand in hand. Self-care. Uh, you must eat healthy. You must eat right. And they advise in this article that one should find some type of routine of exercise. And exercise is so important. Just get, get the moving. You know, when I say get the moving, stay active. Uh, me, myself, I'm getting up in age, and so uh, I just recently uh, went through a physical therapy because of uh, old Arthur came and visited me. When I say old Arthur, I mean Arthur Bridges came, and so the, the, the therapist says for me to stay active because as you get older, you know, sometimes we want to feel that we want to sit in our rocking chair. And so in this day and time, we ain't got time for no rocking chair. One thing we got to do is get busy, eat, eat right, and exercise, all right? It's vital to practice solid self-care as a way to maintain positive ways of coping. Ultimately, exercise helps to release endorphins, which are chemicals in the brain that makes a person feel good without synthetic means, all right? And so we have our own uh, pleasure sensory. Uh, it's already... Uh, built in in our body, we don't need nothing else. Uncovering activities and hobbies that make, oh, what, oh yeah, number six, okay, I'm, I'm jumping the gun. So we're going to number seven. Number seven says maintain a, a routine. Misusing drugs create chaos in a person's life. This often leads to high levels of stress and anxiety. Therefore, to cope with cravings, it is essential to create a regular daily routine and stick with it. Of course, it is important not to be bombarded with certain surprises or mishaps during the day. However, having a regular routine provides necessary structures to life. This makes it easier to enjoy balance and to cope with minor troubles when they occur. Number eight, let's talk about number eight. Number eight is talking about participate in enjoyable activities. Very important. Participate in things that you uh, enjoy. All right, and it says uncovering activities, activities and hobbies that make a person happy 
brings joy to his or her life. In fact, finishing a project delivers feelings of accomplishment. A person's brain concentrates on these activities, it becomes more difficult to dwell on drugs or al alcohol. Eventually, a person realizes important things in life. And so it's very important to participate in enjoyable activities because it helps you to stay focused on the accomplishment instead of the failure. And number nine, the last one, it says find gratitude. Woo find some type of gratitude. One of the biggest and most effective coping mechanisms that a person can learn in recovery is gratitude. As an individual faces personal struggles, it is helpful to keep in mind that others struggle with the same things. In fact, being thankful for what a person has makes it easy to turn away from drugs and alcohol. And so when you uh, be grateful for all the accomplishment that you have uh, gained from being in recovery, uh, gratitude goes a long way. It, it lets you know that uh, you can do it, you can succeed without use, using or utilizing any uh, substances, whether it be alcohol or drugs, uh, that you can maintain and that you can uh, accomplish these things without the use of those uh, vices and so that you can feel good and say, you know what, I did, I did such and such, you know, I got a job, you know, I did that on my own. I went back to school. I went and did that on my own, you know, with the help of others. You know, you don't want to say me, 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 but you want to give yourself some credit, you know, because you're invested in yourself. So you want to say, you know what, I can do uh, things um, in a positive way. I can be uh, someone who is accomplished. And so you must encourage yourself and let and don't let no one uh, steal your joy. And so always encourage yourself and be mindful that you are worth living for. All right, I just want to share that little uh, tidbit with you. Thanks for joining in, and uh, I'll see you prayerfully next week. All right, stay blessed.